we somehow at an institution like this live by the rhythm of our bells. Maybe sometime we'll have an assembly over in Illini Hall so that we can start whenever we want. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, are these photographs great. Um, it's a great honor here to, for me to uh, stand in front of you to introduce a few people to celebrate the uh, uh, life and career of Heine Halberstam. I didn't know Heine very well. He retired in 1996 before I got here, and so it wouldn't be much point in my reviewing his career since there's this marvelous uh, synopsis back here. When I, when I first met Heine, uh, though I did want to say one or two things. I, I did get to know him a little bit uh, in the last year. Um, when I first became chair, my main impression was uh, just one of astonishment because there was this sort of very elegant man who exuded confidence every time I saw him. And I thought, you know, this must be the confidence, most confident man on the face of the planet because he arrived here to become chair of this department from somewhere else in uh, 1980. And I'd been in this department for 12 years when I became chair and I still didn't feel ready. Um, so uh, that, that really made a, a strong Im impression uh, on me. Uh, but then I got to know him through a very uh, fortunate accident. Uh, a student who was in the College of Media here called me up and said that he wanted to make um, a, a film, a documentary film, about a Chinese mathematician named Hua. And did I know anything about him? He had apparently been here in the, in the, in the 40s. And I went and looked in Wikipedia, and I went and looked for about Hua, and it turned out essentially everything written in English about Hua that I found, all the top hits, had been written by Heine. And I read a marvelous article in the Mathematical Intelligencer. And so I, I remember speaking to Heine, in fact, he was sitting in that chair over there, and said, I've got this gentleman from China who wants to come, uh, 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 who wants to learn a little bit about Hua's time here, and would you be willing to speak to him? And Heine lit up, and so I'd be delighted to speak about Hua. He was a very interesting man. And it was a very nice conversation. And I remarked on this to Scott Algren, and uh, he said, oh, you just, you don't realize, when I was at Colorado, when Heine came to visit, he was just such a friendly person. It was just, he just really welcomed, he made you feel welcome in the community. And interestingly enough, I was out uh, at Berkeley just uh, last uh, 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 month, and I ran into, oh, I'm going to get the name wrong, so I got to look at my notes here, David Grant, who's the chair at Colorado, and the first thing he said to me was, oh dear, he said, I heard that Heine died. He was a wonderful person, and he started saying exactly the same things that Scott had, so that was a, a, a very nice uh, sort of thing for me to, 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 to learn uh, from talking to him and from talking to, uh, to Heine. Then I would be remiss if I didn't mention one other thing, which is that um, another wonderful experience I had related to Heine was when I was hosting with Amy, my wife, the, um, <coughs> the retirees lunch, uh, maybe last fall or the fall before, and um, Amy was able to come that time, and I'm very grateful to Doreen and to Felice Bateman for sitting, by, sitting Amy down, and Doreen said, well, we came here, and the first week, Heine said, we're going to have a party for the department. And I said, how many people? And he said, oh, about 250. <laughs> and, Fili and, and, and Doreen said to Amy, you don't have to do that. <laughs> and Amy was extremely happy about this conversation, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, uh, here with us to, for this celebration. So uh, I think before we go on with the, the other persons, I'd like to play just a little clip of the video. Wamedis returned to Illinois to receive an honorary doctoral degree from the university. Professor Heine Halberstein was a longtime friend of Hua, and he invited Hua for a dinner at his home. I, I, I worked in Nottingham at that time, a city in England, Nottingham. And he visited me there, and then he visited me here. Um, so ever since we first met, we've met at the reasonable regu regular intervals whilst he was alive. He was a very nice man. And he came here to Champaign-Urbana uh, when it was the uh, degree time, degree ceremony time. And so he, um, I was designated to drive him 
to the ceremony and his daughter-in-law and his assistant because uh, my husband was part of the uh, of the ceremony himself in his cap and gown and so on. It's a very big occasion here. And um, it, was, it was very pleasant. He was such a nice man. And uh, I can't remember very much about it. I do remember that he was in a wheelchair. Actually. Okay, well, um, so next I'd like to introduce Earl Berkson uh, from our department, who will say the first of several remarks about Heine. And I will help you with the microphone here. Yes, that can please be my do. job. I want to get away from that plant because of my yeah, all right. well, <laughs> allergies. I'll put the microphone there. All right, and we'll give this to you. You can either hold it in your hand or it has a clip. How about if I go there? Away from the plants. I yeah, how about he, here, well, and I'll move the plant over there. there. That's great. I think we're in good shape now. Mm, sounds good. Okay. Uh, what I'm noticing is that we're all, there's going to be a lot of duplication in, in all these tributes to Heine because he really was that great and everybody who knew him saw these things in him. Uh, I've known him, of course. I knew him when he first came here and I had the great pleasure of befriending Heine and his wonderful family. Um, in the aftermath of Heine's passing, I've asked myself whether any words of consolation, however inadequate, might be found in the themes of classical literature, literature which Heine, ever the wordsmith, uh, of course, firmly appreciated. In this regard, the one theme that keeps popping up is the time-honored analogy of likening great losses with the falling of mighty trees. One such example occurs in Book Two of Virgil's Aeneid, in which Aeneas recounts the fall of his native Troy by relating, Troy uprooted was overturning, like an ancient ash tree high up among the mountains. But the most apt version that comes to mind is from Edwin Markham's poem, Lincoln the Man of the People, in which he describes the incalcul incalculable loss of Abraham Lincoln with the lines, and when he fell in whirlwind, he went down as when a lordly cedar green with boughs goes down with a great shout upon the hills and leaves a lonesome place against the open sky. Heine was one of the very finest and most decent persons I've ever known, highly principled, valorous, magnanimous, and warmly human. He was one of the very small number of researchers who changed the way mathematicians view their craft. As in Markham's poem, his irreplaceable loss has left, it all, left us all with a lonesome place in our hearts. He was equally at home with all segments of the mathematical community's panoply, ranging from students to winners of the coveted Salem Prize in Mathematical Analysis to Fields Medalists, the mathematical equivalent, of course, of Nobel laureates. I'll leave more specific description of his mathematical achievements to the number of theorists present today. Suffice it to say that Heine had a frequent collaborator in Harold Diamond, who co-authored numerous notable works with Heine, including a recent book on one of their signature topics, Civ Theory. In closing, I'd like to offer some reflections on my personal experiences with Heine. On rare occasions, I had witnessed him get, get upset with someone else, but each sub, such instance was nothing more than a spring cloudburst that left flowers in its wake after ending quickly. Always quick to accentuate the positive, he never bore hard feelings against anyone. He once said to me, anger does not solve anything. While my head told me he was right, I was not always as successful as he was at adopting this aphorism viscerally. One tactic for implementing it that uh, I'd learned by watching him in action was to pose the question, who's in charge here? And it can really work wonders, particularly for someone with his considerable charm. Speaking of his charm, I once was surprised to hear him intone privately, they can't do this to our sort. Having, as for me, having been born and raised in the USA, which calls itself the can-do land, I was quite sure that this was an aristocratic effect of Heine's British bearing that wouldn't work over here particularly when you think of candidate Obama saying, yes, we can. Uh, but it always, did, it always did work for him. His humanism was courageous, contagious and courageous. Last but not least, I would like to point out that for all his accomplishments, Heine had a very unassuming manner, which made him a great listener 
and left his interlocutors feeling good about themselves. It was by chance that I learned from another very reliable source that the family name Halberstam is revered in Orthodox Jewish circles since it identifies its bearer as a descendant of one of the original disciples of the Baal Shem Tov, the uh, kind keeper of the holy name, who is the founder of Hasidic Judaism. But Heine himself, I think, um, of course knew about this, but the secular humanist in him was content not to broadcast it. I'll miss him very much, always. Of my many associations with Heine over a period of 33 years, I would like to relate uh, today one very personal one to illustrate first his support for me and others, and secondly, to demonstrate its pivotal importance to my career. In approximately 1982, Springer Verlag's book editor, Walter Kaufman Bueller, visited Illinois primarily to discuss the publication of the collected papers of the famous Chinese number theorist Hua Lu Keng, which were being edited by Halberstam. One afternoon, Heine phoned and asked me to come to his office to meet Kaufman Bueller. After arriving in Heine's office, Kaufman Bueller told me that Heine had told him that I was engaged in the long project of attempting to prove all the entries in Ramanujan's notebooks. He asked me if I had ever thought of putting this material in books, and I told him this had never occurred to me. Kaufman Bueller emphasized that Springer Fairlog would be glad to publish books containing my work on Ramanujan, and so I immediately agreed to Kaufman Bueller's proposal. Needless to say, I owe an enormous thanks to Kaufman Bueller and especially to Halberstam for perhaps the most important turning point in my career. All right. Just talk, right? Yes, that's it. You just talk into it. They don't have to do anything at all. Am I all set? You're all set. Okay. <clears throat> I loved Heine Halberstam. I'd only known him for the latter part of his life for the past eight years. But we were favorite friends and uh, just enjoyed each other's company. He had an ironic, a humorous, slant on most everything. And I could always set him off by talking positively about American education, which he deplored. <laughs> we first met in what's called a Havara. Uh, that's a small group formed by members of, uh, of uh, Sinai Temple. And they put together a group of older people. There were nine of us. And it, event, it eventually dissolved. One reason it dissolved is that four of the people died. <laughs> you know, but when it was going, it, it was really wonderful because we talked very frankly and very openly about who we were and what we wanted, and it was very intimate. Um, there were intense discussions. And in one session, Heine told about the story of the Holocaust and his mother. And he told it with tears in his eyes. I've heard him tell the story before without tears. But this time he had tears. And, um, and especially that his mother had taken care of him to make sure that he got away. <clears throat> 
um, and then that was before she thought of herself. But a 10-year-old boy <clears throat> sent off to a strange, sent off to strangers in a strange land must have felt a sense of abandonment and loss and later guilt about his mother. I mean, why should his mother die and, well, and he lives? Um, but these difficulties didn't seem to affect his career as he had a brilliant mathematical journey and was honored by his peers. <clears throat> Heine was a modest man. <clears throat> I never realized how distinguished he was <clears throat> until I read um, his biography on the back of the announcement for this memorial service, and I, and I saw all of his accomplishments. Um, <clears throat> I would tell Heine about uh, my modest accomplishments, and he would always say, very good, Ed, but he would never counter with some, some comparable story of his own. I mean, he never engaged in academic dueling or you know, uh, or boasting about his, his achievements. Um, <clears throat> I'd given a copy of a book I wrote in, um, on anthropology of tourism that was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2005. And um, he read it, or he read parts of it, because he commented and discussed, discussed it with me and, Told me, told me what some of my next steps should be, which was, and they were very good comments. Uh, but then, uh, but then, um, reciprocally, <clears throat> later on, he gave me a, a, a copy of his recent book that he had written with Harold Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, and I couldn't even understand the introduction. <laughs> I mean, I still have it in my library, but uh, I don't understand a word of it. Um, I, I don't know if he did that with a sense of humor or, or, or what. <clears throat> uh, after the Havara group broke up, uh, Doreen and Heine and my wife and I would go out to lunch maybe two, three times a month and our friendship only deepened during this period. I miss Heine, and I cry to myself when I think about him. One of my last memories was when, was when I visited him in the hospital after his final sickness had begun, and uh, he had refused to eat, and his son Michael was in the hospital room. And I knew one of Heine's favorite desserts was tiramisu. So I went and bought some tiramisu. I knew he wasn't eating. You know, I knew he wasn't eating. So, so I brought the tiramisu, you know, and he devoured it, a part of it, you know, part of it. Just, just as he devoured life. He was a remarkable man, a serious intellectual with a great sense of humor about himself and about the world, and I shall never forget him. Thank you very much. So, uh, yes, as we celebrate the life of this wonderful man who influenced and impacted the lives of so many, so many people in his life and career, both as, as teacher, mentor, and colleague and friend. Um, I feel fortunate 
in my life to have known him in, in all of these roles. And, and perhaps uh, the, well, the biggest influence he had was when I first came to Illinois as a, as a grad student in uh, 1990 and uh, was a little unsure of myself, uh, what I really wanted to do with life. And, um, you know, was really enthusiastic about mathematics, but uh, didn't really know about, uh, you know, what uh, mathematics was as a career or uh, whether I was really fit for, you know, uh, doing research or whatever. And, uh, and I, I remember the, the first class I took with him and, and how it really opened my eyes to, uh, I said, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> the kind of things that, that, uh, that he was showing me and uh, that, that I, I really, it really clicked, the kind of mathematics he was doing and uh, uh, his, his impeccable lecturing style. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I remember some of our first uh, visits um, in his office when I, would go to the library and try to read a paper, some old paper maybe by Paul Erdish, and I would get stuck on some part. Um, Erdish would mention something about Brune's method, and I didn't know what this meant or what it was all about, and I would go and ask Heine. Um, and he would uh, very patiently tell me what it was all about and where to, where to find the uh, the information where to where the reference was, and uh, you know, in this particular instance, uh, you know, he told me that this was something called uh, an old an old word for something that in modern language was called sieve methods. And little did I know that he was one of the world's experts on the subject. <laughs> so I was very fortunate to uh, to uh, have him as as my uh, mentor on that, and uh, and then later. Um, as I started, uh, you know, getting into other subjects, and uh, I found a I found a problem that I found uh, interesting, and went and asked Paul Bateman about it because it seemed to be in his area, and he said, "No, no, this is this is something you should ask Heine about." So um, Paul got on the phone. I still remember this story because it's. So Paul got on the phone and, and ringed up um, Heine in his office and said, um, yeah, I've got this, this student and, and he's got this interesting problem. Um, why, don't, why don't you uh, talk to him about it? And, uh, and Heine said, great, yeah, fine, send him over. So um, Paul hung up the phone and I walked next door to Heine's office. <laughs> It's a true story. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> what what the, the reason was behind it. They were both uh, former, you know, heads of the department. I guess used to, you know, get, getting on the phone and calling <laughs> at the time. But uh, yeah, I, uh, um, you know, he was always very, very patient, and and I, I learned. I learned a lot from every session we had in, uh, you know, in his, in his office and, you know, um, he, he just exuded uh, a love for mathematics. Um, he, he, I don't know, we, we just clicked. Um, it, it, it's hard to, to, to say in words, er, er, you know, what, what, what the attraction was, what, uh, you know, everything that, that I felt, but, um, you know, the, the love for mathematics was certainly a, a common bond. Um, his, his, um, uh, his high standards that he set not only for himself, but, but uh, um, that he expected of others, uh, his students and in particular, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate to have had him as as a as a mentor and teacher, and I was um, very happy to have uh, had the opportunity to come back here and uh, 
to have uh, been able to call him a colleague later in life and <laughs> Uh, to come back to this place uh, as, uh, as a member of the faculty. So, uh. Are you willing to get suited up here? Sure. Uh, according to an ancient uh, Indian tale, <coughs> several blind men are investigating the nature of an elephant. And they give their individual reports. <coughs> the one touching the tail says there must be like a rope. The one feeling the trunk is sure that the animal is a branch of a tree, and so on. Similarly, Heine touched us in so many ways that our accounts of him are many and varied. I'm going to talk first about his encouraging style in dealing with people and then turn to some of his mathematical activities. My family and I met <coughs> Heine, Doreen, and their family in the fall of 1973 while on sabbatical at the University of Nottingham in England. Heine was just returning from leave at that time, and he had a full plate of activities. But he was very generous of his time and helpful to me and my family. Heine's optimistic nature soon showed itself when I talked with him about the problems that our son was having at school. Andy was five years old, had never been to school before, and suddenly found himself in a classroom with 50 children, really 50. He came home each day exhausted from concentrating in his new environment. Also, he spoke funny, and he got ribbed for it. And the food that was served at the, high school, at the school cafeteria offended him beyond measure. <laughs> After Heine heard this litany, he replied in his calming manner, one, Andy, like all their children, would get used to school, two, he would soon acquire the worst Nottingham accent you had ever heard. <laughs> and three, he would demand the same kind of food at home as they had, had at school. <laughs> and of, of course, this is what happened. <clears throat> During the winter we were in Britain, there were many crippling strikes, including the great coal strike that brought Mrs. Thatcher to power. Buildings were heated even less than usual. The city was dark because the streetlights had been turned off and it was quite grim. The Halberstams did not let such things get them down. When we visited their home, we gathered in one room, they closed all the doors and turned on every electric heater they owned. It was a warm and cheerf cheerful time being with them. Heine had another side, one that saw the world the way it was. There had been some news of a major natural, natural catastrophe in America, perhaps an earthquake or a hurricane. When I commented on this to Heine and asked whether analogous disasters took place in Britain, no, he replied with a wry smile, ours are all man-made. One of Heine's particular passions, perhaps remembering how he had been aided and encouraged as a child, was promoting talented young people. Those who were his students clearly benefited from his attention and commitment. But in addition, many others who came in contact with Heine as students or postdocs also received enormous help and support. Uh, and this was often decisive in launching their careers. In this number, I mention a few. Jean-Marc Desoulier of the University of Bordeaux, who lists Heine as his second advisor because of his valuable postdoc experience in Nottingham. Robert Vaughan of Penn State, whose postdoc year with Heine brought him into contact with problems and ideas that shaped the rest of his career. My own PhD student, Jean-Min Song, 
whose thesis topic was one suggested by Heine and whose research was supervised as much by him as by myself. Another example of the lengths that Heine would go to to help young people was told to me by Atul Dixit, a recent PhD from our department. Atul wanted to read a 16-page research paper of an eminent 19th century Czech mathematician named Lurch. This was a classic good news, bad news situation. Dixit was able to find a paper, which was good. But it was in Czech, which was bad. <laughs> However, here was Heine, who had lived as a boy in Czechoslovakia. On the other hand, Heine's rusty Czech vocabulary was that of a 10-year-old. Finally, the good news. Heine got out his Czech English dictionary and wrote out by hand a full translation of the paper. My mathematical connection with Heine arose from a common interest in sieve theory. He and Hans Egon Richert of the University of Ulm took me on as an equal partner in their sieve research that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. During the course of this work, uh, which went on for many years, uh, Richert died and Heine and I finished the project with much computer help from several of my PhD students. Our result extended a classical sieve theorem and led to some better applications. We wrote up a form of this work with my former student, uh, Will Galway, in a book published by Cambridge University Press. This was the uh, book that uh, Ed referred to before. And I should say that the only other person that really enthusiastic about it was my mother. <laughs> yeah. the, the royalties from this book have not been sufficient to finance our retirements. Yeah. When I began working on these projects with Heine, I was apprehensive about meetings when I had no progress to report, particularly since Heine could blow his top when he sensed laziness or indifference. But Heine felt an effort was being made and he was nothing but encouraging, and so I came to feel relaxed in working with him. There had been a football player on the Chicago Bears, an, an alumnus of Yale, who was described by his teammates as leading the team in completed sentences. <laughs> in addition to his athletic ability, Heine excelled in this quality as well. With amazing quickness and seemingly little effort, Heine produced wonderful writing on topics as varied as book reviews, administrative reports, letters of condolence, or explanations of mathematical intricacy. His sentences were typically long and elegant. Indeed, readers of our joint papers can easily decide which of us prepared the last draft. Yeah. Heine's first major book, uh, Sequences, was written with Klaus Roth, uh, his former classmate and a Fields Medal winner. As the authors say in the introduction, the main theme of this book is the study of integer sequences with a view to finding properties common to or relating to extensive classes of such sequences. The book provided a connected and, and readable account of several important topics in additive number theory that previously were accessible only in research papers. Topics include addition of sequences and density calculations, some estimated via algebraic or combinatorial techniques and others via analysis. Among the beautiful results in this uh, book uh, are presented theorems of Schnurlmann, Knazer, Mann, and Erdos Fuchs, each a major accomplishment. Another of the major topics in the book is Erdos's probabilistic method of showing that some complicated sets <coughs> are non-empty. Th this book had the property that it was, it was uh, digested from the individual papers and rewritten in a comprehensive, comprehensible manner. And this is something that many uh, such survey books do not achieve. 
Heine's most important research theme was uh, sieve theory, which he pursued with Richard. Sieve theory is a method of estimating the number of elements left in a set if those having certain properties have been uh, removed. So now, Ed, you're ready to read the rest of the book. <laughs> A different description of this work, coming from a mindless computer translation of Richard's obituary, was that it is an analysis of industrial filtration processes. <laughs> yeah. So um, Halberstam and Richard prepared an account of the subject of their book, uh, Civ Methods, that was authoritative and contained many interesting examples. And with it, researchers could for the first time, quote, general sieve results instead of having to derive them from scratch for each application. The point that Kevin made in his uh, talk where Erdos referred to and by Brun's method was where people just said, well, you can carry out this sieve process and then the reader was left to deal with it on his own. And Halberstam and Rickert uh, put this in a systematic manner where the people who had such a problem could look it up and uh, have uh, conditions and just quote a theorem on the subject. This was one of the rare technical books that not only sold out, but whose used copies were resold for hundreds of dollars a piece. I, I'm very <laughs> envious. The, the publisher was delighted to issue a new edition. In the mid-1960s, a remarkable new number theoretic uh, methodology called the large sieve was developed by Roth and Enrico Bambieri. This generated much excitement for it led to certain um, prime number estimates previously accessible only under the assumption of the famous Riemann hypothesis. Heine participated actively in its development. Among his contributions is the Barbon Davenport Halberstam theorem giving a mean square estimate of the prime number theorem error term simultaneously for many arithmetic progressions. He also had an important conjecture here, joint with Peter Elliott, about how many arithmetic progressions could be included in such formulas. The mathematical community is greatly indebted to Heine for his many contributions. He was an active member of the London Mathematical Society and had served as its vice president. Until he became the department head at Illinois, Heine was a mainstay of the mathematical reviews, writing over 150 reviews by himself. He was an editor or co-editor of 10 volumes of collected works and conference proceedings, <clears throat> and he was an editor or manager of several journals. Heine touched many people in many ways, and we shall miss him. Let us use this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ed, uh, a little revenge. Um, my sister's book, Feminine Masculinity, was published a few years ago, and, and my father said that he couldn't understand a word of that, so um, <laughs> on, on gender theory. I, I often wonder if an academic's highest achievement is not to write a book that no one can understand. Um, you hope at a memorial to conjure a momentary image of the departed. With this image, we can mourn the loss of someone we cared about and admired and hopefully carry a piece of them forward into the world and through our lives, help them live beyond their short time under the stars. And there is an enormous amount to care about and admire in Heine Halberstam. He survived an impossible childhood. He was a refugee from the horrors of Nazi-occupied Europe. His mother met her end in a labor camp, and his father died of heart disease when Heine was quite young. He came to England with nothing, and though he was certainly lucky in finding his way to a remarkable woman called Anne Wellsford, who gave him a foster home and saw to his education, where a lesser man might have been felled or tempted to wallow in self-pity, 
he set about the process of making a life for himself with enormous determination and willpower. That same determination and willpower infused his parenting skills. Over the course of my childhood, my father demanded the highest standards of his children. He was impatient with anything that he perceived as less than sharp thinking, intolerant of what he considered laziness, and above all, exacting in the process of education. When I was about seven, he took me to the library and told me that at his age, he was reading Dickens and demanded that I follow suit. So I did as I was told with the fear of God behind me, and within two or three years, I'd read much of the fiction available to me in the children's library and had to apply for access to the adult library. Um, in fact, when the librarian suggested that I could not possibly have read all the books available to me, I challenged her to find one that I hadn't read, which she could not. Uh, I was reading Thomas Hardy by age 12, a slow learner perhaps comparative to Dickens at seven, but we all suspect that he might have been prone to hyperbole and exaggeration from time to time. Um, regardless, it is certain to me that without his driving force behind me, I would have been content to while away the hours watching television, as many kids do, and I might have wasted my education. He told me once that great learning can be best accomplished while one is young enough to concentrate on the task ahead and he was quite right. When asked why he thought that numbers were beautiful, Paul Erdős replied, it's like asking why is Ludwig van Beethoven's Ninth Symphony beautiful? If you don't see why, someone can't tell you. I know numbers are beautiful. If they aren't beautiful, nothing is. As a side note, Paul Erdisch did not have the same respect for linen. When he stayed with us once in Champagne while working in bed, he allowed his fountain pen to rest on the sheets and fell asleep. The pen subsequently bled and completely stained and ruined a perfectly good set of sheets. <laughs> However, I digress. <laughs> I didn't share a lot in common on the surface with my father, and communication, therefore, took a little work. But as all you parents know, sometimes to your dismay, children learn from our parents not so much by following what they say as imitating what they do and who they are. I run a theater in Chicago, and whereas I am an artist and look for the beauty in sculpting true emotions, my father looked for and sculpted the beauty of numbers and equations. I once suggested to him that pure mathematics was like the purest form of art in that there was no taste factor involved. He contradicted me at once, which he did a lot. He pointed out that, for instance, to spend one's life's work trying to prove a theorem that everybody knew could be proved might be considered by some to be in poor taste. Funnily enough, I feel the same way about plays which teach us what we already knew when we walked into the theater. As Mark Haddon writes in The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, prime numbers are what is left when you have taken all the patterns away. I think prime numbers are like life. They are very logical, but you could never work out the rules even if you spent all your time thinking about them. So perhaps we are not so far apart in profession. A couple of years ago, he told me that when he was young, he had once thought he might be a painter in his way, perhaps he was a painter with numbers. After all, according to Descartes, all things in nature occur mathematically. He was a kind, gracious, charming, and caring man, a gregarious entertainer, a fine raconteur, and he had a dry and sarcastic wit that could both entertain and occasionally, if you found yourself on the wrong end of it, lacerate. I'm working on that one in myself. At a number theory conference celebrating his retirement some years ago, I had a remarkable experience. Former student after former student pulled me aside to say how much Heine had helped them, that he had made an introduction for them or helped them get a paper published or supported them in being appointed to a position. They all alluded to the fierce competitive nature of their field and how grateful they were to have a rare ally in my father who supported them when it would have been more common to neglect them. 
Coming to America seemed like a traumatic decision in 1980, but it turned out to be a good thing for all involved. It is not an accident, I think, that my sister Judith and I both felt happier here. We are both gay and needed the emergent psychological freedoms that come with the territory in these United States. He and Doreen were understanding when we both came out and made no attempts to suggest that we might somehow be broken or ill, and on the few occasions that we talked about it, he recognized that homosexuality was not a choice but part of nature. I asked my father once if he believed in God. He said he believed in Spinoza's God. And as Spinoza said, whatsoever is, is in God. And without God, nothing can be or be conceived. He was embracing of our partners, always kind, never judgmental. He was the same when it came to my chosen profession. It was not a profession I would have chosen for you, but you don't make me feel uncomfortable on stage, so if it's what you want to do, you should go ahead. When I made it into the theater department here at the university, he said, well, we'll just wait and see if you get accepted into the University of Illinois. And when I was accepted by the university, beaming with pride, he said, that's very, very satisfactory. <laughs> High praise, indeed. He was by no means a saint. He had a short temper, was even known to jump up and down and shout from time to time when he was particularly agitated. He was desperately impatient to just try to wait in any kind of line with him for more than a couple of minutes or a restaurant, and he'd start to fidget and complain, what's taking so long? This is ridiculous. But I don't believe in saints. He was deliciously and completely human. And as we say, our greatest strengths are usually our greatest weaknesses. He was only as hard on the world in ways that he was hard on himself, and the standards to which himself he held ensured a remarkable and admirable life. As much as I know my father more through observing his behaviors in myself, perhaps, than in the closeness of our relationship, no one probably knew him better in the world than Doreen. His first wife, my mother, was taken from him in a brutal car accident in France in 1971. He was exceptionally lucky to then meet and marry Doreen, who gave him an exemplary marriage, a beautiful home, a true friendship, and just as important as any of these things, a dignified and loving departure. We should all be so lucky to have such a successful companionship. As to his legacy, his children and family are all functional, happy, fulfilled, successful in their professions, and we all had a long, healthy relationship with our father. Furthermore, he has thousands of students and many colleagues who were affected by his work and will carry forward his intellectual and spiritual legacy. It was a privilege to be his son. I loved him dearly, and I miss him profoundly. You will forgive me if I quote from perfect timing from my own field of study. Our rebels now are ended and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. Our little life is rounded in a sleep. Heine, I thank you. Your life was very, very satisfactory. <laughs> Would you join me now in a theatrical tradition and stand and give my father a standing ovation for a life well lived? for Heine Halberstam, ladies and gentlemen.